I try to make, uh, well, maybe, maybe not the first couple of classes, but as, shortly as we get into it, as I try to spell out what some people refer to New Testament priesthood <clears throat> and as to what I see uh, that that represents. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Excuse me as I do my normal early on preaching and coughing and hacking. First Peter <clears throat> chapter 2 and verse uh, 5 and well, we'll read verse 9 after that. Ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. All right, and then verse 9. <clears throat> but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a people of his own, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And why don't you keep your place here, because I'm going to come back here and we'll address some of the things that are there. <clears throat> so don't lose your spot, but go to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation 1. We're going to read verse 5 and 6. Uh, have you got it yet? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loveth... Uh, uh, unto him that loveth us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and made us a kingdom of priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then finally, chapter 5 of Revelation. <clears throat> And verse 10, and has made, made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. <clears throat> all right. Basically, <clears throat> what I have read to you already is <clears throat> pretty much the basic scriptures in the New Testament that talk about us being a priesthood, other than the book of Hebrews, which talks about us being a <clears throat> priesthood after the order of Melchizedek and all that, and we'll get into that. But if you if you leave out the book of Hebrews, this is this these are the main scriptures that speak of of a New Testament priesthood. And um, what we're going to do in this first class is we're just going to examine these scriptures a little bit <clears throat> to try to orientate our minds and our spirit to the real meaning of priesthood and to how God sees that priesthood. <clears throat> so back in 1 Peter, if you will, <clears throat> you did keep your place there, 1 Peter chapter 2. We just read verse 5. Ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood <clears throat> to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. All right. <clears throat> Sounds like a real simple scripture. Anybody can understand it. No big deal. <clears throat> However, let's just make it clear from the very beginning that what the priesthood was to God in the Old Testament, what the priesthood was to God was those people 
whose lives were set aside to give God what was acceptable to him. It was those people. And it wasn't just anybody. It was those whose lives were set aside to give to God what pleased him. <clears throat> okay. Now, what you have to realize is that what, God, what, what the priests gave to God were sacrifices. Okay? However, they did not just give God any sacrifice. They didn't like, okay, I'm a priest, and I'm going to walk in my house, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really be with God, so I'm going to sacrifice my my secular CDs. And that be what God would call an acceptable sacrifice. Oh, good, I want to listen to them. You know, like God's real interested in our CDs. Oh, this is a treasure. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> he's not all caught up in, in all of that. But he is caught up in his son. And if you consider that every Old Testament sacrifice and every sacrifice given, you know, on any day at any time represented the offering up of Christ, represented giving Christ, shall I say, uh, we'll explain this later, in a sacrificial manner, the giving of Christ to God. The giving of Christ. Okay, now, <clears throat> it is clear that the sacrifices had to be a certain, there had to be a certain thing that pertained to every one of them, and that was that that, whatever, whatever it was, whether it be a bullock, which was a young bull, or a pigeon, or a whatever, you know, a lamb, or whatever it was that they offered to God, that offering had to be without spot or blemish. Well, that leaves us out right there. We got problems, folks. Right here in this room, we got more spots and blemishes than we could, we'd, we'd really want to enumerate. I mean, we got problems, and, you know, some might call us the cream of the crap, a crop. <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry, did I, I didn't, surely I didn't say, <laughs> but if we are, that's what we're the cream of. <clears throat> no, it's not, because that's what we are apart from Christ, and if Jesus is, if, if Jesus is the acceptable sacrifice, then even the very cream of the crop is unacceptable. What does this mean? There's not one single sacrifice that God accepted that he didn't say, in your heart, through faith, you're offering me the son. Because if you're not, if you're giving up this and you're looking holy and you're doing good and you're, you know, you're doing all this stuff so that I will accept you. <clears throat> you know, let's just say this right now. Going the extra mile is not the deal. Jesus is the extra mile. His life is the extra mile. Any, anything that we do would be us, and we would think that we're holy or we're special. When we are, in truth, what is rejected at the cross and only accepted in the Beloved. Doesn't it say that in Ephesians? That he is the beloved of God. And I'm not. But, and if you understand the cross correctly, you understand that me... I am crucified with Christ because I'm the part that is not acceptable. 
and he is accepted. Do you agree with that, that he is accepted? Okay. But did he, after the cross, make us acceptable where he accepts us? And the answer is, no, we're not accepted by the beloved, but the scriptures say we are accepted in. That means we're in, in what does the word in mean? In union. It doesn't just mean location. It means so in union with this vine that his vine life flows through my skinny little branch. Or your tubby little branch, however you want to look at it, you know. <clears throat> but it is his life that is acceptable. So that when the father looks, he says, this is my beloved son. And he's not talking about me. He's talking about his son. Now, am I included in that? Yes, you are, as long as you're not the source, but the vessel or vehicle of him. Okay? We're, what, are, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the foundation of priesthood. We're talking about the foundation of daily being a priesthood. We're talking about offering to God what it is he wants, which is Christ, the acceptable sacrifice. He also as living stones are built to a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In other words, he didn't just say, now think, think how this could be worded. You are God's priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that would be acceptable to God. It only left one thing out. By Jesus Christ. Because only what's acceptable comes by him. Only. Only. Because if it wasn't, if it, if it wasn't the case, then why start a new covenant? Because the old covenant was simply people doing the right thing for God, not necessarily it being, you understand what I mean, as long as they're trying to do the right thing, then you could be acceptable. But God said, all have sinned, and not only just sinned, but come short of the glory of God. There's only one that I accept. That's my son. That's Jesus. So the Jews, the point for the Jews to even come into a new covenant, we'll get into all of that in this class, but the, the, only, the only way that they could even recognize that there was a need for a new covenant was to see not the problem with the covenant, but the weakness of the flesh. Um, what is it, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Uh, for God, what is it, God saying the law that uh, the problem wasn't with the law but through the weakness of our flesh. That's where the real problem lies. That's not just failing flesh. That is unacceptable flesh. It's not Christ. And every priest, every person, if a, if a rich person came in and could offer a, 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 a young calf without spot or blemish, he better be thinking in terms of th this is not me. That sacrifice on this altar here is God's substitute that's given me a right to even stand here because if that substitute, if that one was not the preeminent thing I'm giving God, then I die. I'm rejected. And if a poor person came in and all they have to offer is two turtle doves, I don't, I'm not rich enough in myself to give you a bullock, but it all represents Christ. So you offer, the point isn't the, the quality in the sense of the magnitude of the offering. The point is that each and every person recognize it as Christ 
and on wherever you're at, you, you know it's not I, but Christ. Now that's Galatians 2.20. That's the basis of priesthood. That's the basis of offering. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. There's rejected flesh. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. Christ liveth in me. There's the acceptable offering, which is Christ. So if the point, if the point wasn't to offer this acceptable sacrifice, which was Christ, and when I say offer it, I mean in our daily walk. I mean in our daily attitudes. I mean in, in all that we're embracing and knowing of this Jesus and, you know, and the preciousness of him, because I don't think a lot of people, I think people understand the preciousness of Jesus based on he's precious because he saved me from going to hell or me from suffering eternal damnation. It, he's precious to me because he bought and paid for my ticket out of hell. But what about this preciousness of him to the Father? And the absolute recognition. When I say acceptable, he's more than acceptable. He satisfies God. We don't satisfy God. Try hard. And, and this was my point about the Jews. The Jews eventually would have to come to the fact that I'm not it, my God. I've been doing that. You know, if you imagine if you're a priest and every day you go in there and you offer a sacrifice and the fire falls and God accepts the sacrifice and it becomes a sweet savor of a burnt offering unto the Father and, you know, and then you walk away scot-free. But you're going to have to do it again because God wants that sacrifice. You realize, I mean, after a while you start going, you know what, I'm really not the big deal here. I'm not the, I'm not what it's, this lamb right here is what he wants. This is the one that pleases him. This is the one. This is the acceptable sacrifice. Okay, now. We all know this in relationship to our salvation. We know that if I try to save myself, I'm a dork. That's just foolishness. What am I thinking? Earning my own salvation. My God, am I an idiot? I know better. I know God only accepts Jesus. Can I get amen on that? Amen. Absolutely we know that. That's right and that's true. But what we don't realize is we walk away from the cross, we walk away from the altar, we walk away from the acceptable sacrifice. Once we're saved, we're going to set forth to become acceptable to God by what we offer. It's, it's not only not an acceptable sacrifice, it's not an acceptable priesthood. It is a foreign priesthood, foreign to God foreign to his plan, offering, <clears throat> offering <clears throat> our attempt to be humble and lamb-like, to give up and to, to do things for God, taking an old blemished lamb that's got a leg turned out and, you know, ears all weird and he's got blemishes all over him and we drag him through the mud of our life, but we're going to give God the lamb, you know, whatever. And, and so we throw him up on that altar, and mud goes everywhere, and we try to light him, cause, but all the mud keeps him from being lit and everything. But we're going to, you know, I'm giving you the lamb of my life. I know you're going to really like this. I mean, after all, it... It took me years to raise this, this lamb. I mean, I put good feed into it. And I kept, I, we brought him into our living room and let him sit with us while we watched TV. We called him Bobby. <laughs> I mean, I'm giving you something that, that you, you, just, you, 
You've got to be loving this, Lord. And he's looking at that broken, spotted, blemished, wrinkled, muddy mess. And he's going, I'm sure this is your best. <laughs> I'm sure of it. This is your best. But this is you. And if it looked way better, it's still the unacceptable offering. The Pharisees looked way better. Did they not? You know, <clears throat> standing on the corner offering prayers. Oh, Lord. Make sure everybody's looking. <laughs> I just want you to know I'm with you. As if God goes, oh, goody. Good to have you, lad. <clears throat> no. No, he's, he's saying, where is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased? We're talking about the, the priesthood. See, this is, this is also the priesthood. Now, we, we, call our, you know, we call ourselves priests. The priesthood wasn't once a week. Am I right or wrong? The priesthood was every day, all the time, offering up the acceptable sacrifice. There was burnt offerings in the morning and burnt offerings in the evening sacrifice. There were sin offerings being given. There's con that altar was going all the time, baby. <clears throat> Not just once a week. You know, well, I'm here on Sunday to give my offering. Buck fifty. God's going, oh, as long as Jesus' picture is on the bill, I'll accept it. No, he's not looking for images. He's looking for the real thing. He's not looking for Xerox copies. You do understand. A Xerox copy is not the real. It's a copy of the real. But it looks so much like him. I have worked hard to make this bill one of the best counterfeit bills so that it would become acceptable. It is a counterfeit. You know, can you imagine a young counterfeiter? <laughs> this hurts so bad to hear this. I mean, I'm trying. You know, and you hear the Lord saying, yes, you're very trying. <clears throat> I mean, you're, you're, trying very it's not about us it is about him and it's not about him on the day of salvation or on Sunday it is about and, and this is here's how, here's how intimate it becomes you look into the father's face <clears throat> see a lot of times we're just living down here we're living down here, so we don't see the Father's face in this stuff. We're just doing stuff, and we're hoping there's a God up there that accepts it. Do you understand what I just said? We're not looking into the Father's face. We're just living on the earth, and so we go, well, I think I'll do this, I think I'll do this good deed. You know, and we go, well, I, ho I hope he really dug that. But in reality, <clears throat> when you're looking into the Father's face, you can see, I can see, when I have given stuff that was me or out from me, and you look at his face, it's not like he's going, I am the God of anger, and I will destroy you for giving me. You know, I mean, that's the way many people view him based on the old covenant. But I look into his face, and I see that look. It's like a disappointment, it's almost like hurt. But then when I offer him Jesus, I watch his countenance. It is the health of his countenance when he sees Jesus. It's just like this. I mean, do God, you know, let's think about it. Two, you know, what, four, four let's say 4,000 years of history 
before Jesus came. You never have the heavens open up. You never hear God, the Father, you know, that's identified. Here's the Father. You never, you never hear him breaking into our world. It's because he's got his son with him. He breaks into our world when his son is right down there and he just rolls back the heavens and he says, okay, you want to know what I'm interested in? This! Beloved! Accepted! Me like! For some of you who may not be able to quite comprehend what it is I'm saying. <coughs> Me gusta! <laughs> I'm telling you, that's incredible that God didn't break in constantly unless you realize he's got nothing to break into our world and I got nothing to say until he sees Jesus and then he just wants to open up everything. It's an incredible moment because, because it's an incredible reality of the Father's heart. That's the key. That's the secret. The Father's heart. The Father's heart who wants his son. And you begin to fall in love with giving the son. Not just giving up. giving up stuff, you know, but giving the Father the thing that is such a joy, you know. I mean, have you ever heard somebody say, you know, they come on TV and they say, give to the children, you'll feel good. You know, goodwill or something comes on. Give your used clothing. You'll feel good. You'll be glad you did. You know, the whole concept of that, come on, listen to me now. The whole concept of that is simply that you'll feel good about you giving something so that you won't feel that you're so selfish. You are so selfish. You're selfish to want to have feelings that you are good. I mean, if you really, I mean, you know, if you just be real, I'm just saying, if you just be real, your motivation for doing it is selfish so that you can get some, you know, even if you feel humble. But to give the Father, the Son, there's something going on there that has nothing to do with you. You know what I mean? When you offer up the Son, the Father just and he's not looking at you and going, good job, Randy. You know, A number one job. You did good with this little one. This is, this is good stuff. He is so enthralled because in his heart, here's, here's the thing. In God's heart, he knows a false priest from a true priest. It's very easy. He has a template in his heart that is after the pattern of Christ. I'm just saying this like this, but I'm trying to help you understand. It, it's, a, it's a mold. It's a Jesus-shaped mold in his heart and in his eyes. And when he looks, he just, it's just like a cookie-cutter mold of Christ, and he's just comparing all the time like this, you know. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro over all the earth, you know. Oh, fit, yeah. There's my son. You know, but everybody else is being religious and humble. And us, at our best. But the father... He's not being satisfied. It's not what you hold back. See, and that's the concept of the old covenant. What we hold back, what we do without, instead of what we give. What 
what touches his heart, what makes a difference to him. Finding, and, and again, on our part it's real easy because when you offer Christ, you can, you can have ten things behind you on a little table and you offer something up and you go, you know, that's not, you know, and you grab something up, you know, and you offer Jesus and you just, yeah, this is my, the heavens start rolling back, you know, you understand what I mean? It's not like, yeah, that's good, I, I dig him. It's not like, it's the heavens rolled back and God breaches into the earth and says, that's what, I want you to understand, that's what I'm interested in. Everybody get it? You know, and so we're supposed to go, dude, he never did that before. That must be like real important to him. But if you're not looking to please him, you'll just miss it. I mean, you'll go, it'll be an event. Just another event in a, in a, in a wandering life that is trying to be touched by God instead of touching God. I just want to have another experience. I just want to, you know, instead of Living union with the one that pleases God and realizing that, the God, that, that God has given us as priests the most incredible position in all of this. <clears throat> we are vessels, administrators of the thing vehicles that bring him the thing that pleases him. The vine is coming out of this branch and pleasing the Father. The treasure is coming out of this earthen vessel and pleasing the Father. All of it, the body is not being a body, it's being a vehicle for the life of Christ. And all of it being... See, I, I, I don't like the concept in priesthood of acceptable, accepted, accepted in the beloved, because Jesus is more than acceptable. He's what he wants. But the concept is there because we are accepted, but only in the beloved. He didn't say, God is overjoyed and thrilled with you. He says, you're accepted. With Jesus, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When's the last time heaven broken up, open, and he did that over you? You know. Man. You know. So the Jews had to come to a realization of what was important. You know, what was truly important? What sanctified what? In the eyes of God, not in the eyes of men. In the eyes of men, the gold sanctifies the altar or temple or whatever. No, 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 not in God's mind. You don't understand. You don't understand. So, very, you know, simple words here. Uh, acceptable, uh, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So if you, now, if you comprehend that, and it's a heart thing, it's not a head thing. If you comprehend that, then, two, when I say that, two things. When you comprehend two, these two things, one, that the Father it's really after his son. And I'm not it. And you're not it. Then your goal becomes real clear as a priest. Real clear. I mean, like clarity comes. Like, 
I mean the confusion of, of religion and, well, what do I, you know, what subject do I get into? I mean, I try to get into prayer and then I realize I'm not witnessing, so I try to get into witnessing and then I realize that I'm not, you know, de you know, dealing with my family enough, so then I get in with my family and I realize that, you know, you see what I mean? And so we're all confused. Well, this makes it real clear. Any prayer that's not acceptable by Christ any Bible reading that's not acceptable by Christ any ministry that I do that is not offering up the Son offering the Father the Son is just Religion. And God's saying, where's the priesthood? Because then it's a, a thing of works, and you don't really need a priesthood if it's just works. I mean, you really don't. You don't need a priesthood if it's really works. Uh, if, if God will accept you totally on what you do and how consecrated you are, then you don't need a priesthood that offers up sacrifice. You just go out and you, you know. But that's the way many people approach it. Once they get saved, okay, I know it was only acceptable by Christ Jesus at my salvation, but now everything else is going to be based on me. My, my, my what? My commitment. My consecration. My, you know, all of that. And so... And that's what we do in youth groups and churches. We stir everybody up. We stir up their flesh to become more consecrated to God, thinking that's what he wants. And he's not looking for that. He's looking for the life of Christ to be about his father's business. Because the, the life of the son will be about his father's business. You won't, do, you, do you think anybody ever had to talk to Jesus about consecration? Can you imagine? Somebody pulling him aside. Now, Jesus, I want to talk to you about consecration. You need to get involved. You need to, I want you to think about this. Prayer changes things. <laughs> think about that. Prayer changes things. Meditate on that. Come, you, you, you awake here, Jesus? You paying attention? You know, because Jesus is drifting off, you know. <laughs> he's, he's, he's already down writing in the dirt. <laughs> you know. And, and, well, folks, we are the body of Christ. Are we not? And is not the life of Christ supposed to be the motivating factor in the body of Christ? Am I right or not? Is that not the truth? And if it is, why are we talking to Jesus about consecration? We should be talking about people, about Jesus being their life. Because if Christ is formed in you, Jesus will do what he does. I mean, that's the hope of the, the hope for the world is Christ. Amen? The hope for the church is Christ. Can you imagine? He's still the hope, even for us. Now, a lot of times we look at ourselves and we say, I know Jesus is my hope because I'm flaky. I mean, I'm, I, I will fail, I will mess up, so I know I need Jesus. Okay, that's all fine and good, but again, that's still looking at ourselves and what we have to give or don't have to give. What is it the Father wants? This thing becomes a thing of bringing joy instead of being committed. Do you see what I mean? Your, your, your joy is to give the Father the Son. And it becomes a thing of, if this is, if, if, if giving him his beloved son makes him well pleased, 
Now, I'll just give you an example. When I was in Bible school, which I was in Bible school when I was in my early 20s, if you can believe that, everything was at that time still in black and white. There was no color in the earth. That came years later. Just kidding. <clears throat> However, TV, no, no, it wasn't. It, we had color TV then too. But it was, you know, I remember being feverish with passion wanting to please the Father. And I remember I was going to please God. And so every time somebody said, well, you know, it pleases God, here's, here's <clears throat> well, I remember this. Like somebody said, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. So I went, okay, you know. Thank you, Jesus. 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 You know, somebody, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, you know, somebody runs over your foot. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, because I wanted to please God. I mean, I was, I was committed to it. And I, you know, everyone else seemed sort of, you know, sort of into it. Bless God, I wanted to please God. And I was, I mean, you know, it ran me ragged because, you know, you pray without seizing ceasing thank you jesus you know you know i mean pray and pray and pray and pray but as soon as you stop praying and say thank you jesus you just you no longer praying without ceasing and as soon as you start praying you're no longer thanking him you know and everything give that you know thank you for this step thank you for that thank you that my brain's functioning thank you that i got a heart still beating thank you you know Thank you for these mosquitoes that are biting me. Thank you for this 100 degree temperature in here. And thank you for, you know, <clears throat> are you praying? No, 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 I'm thanking. And I started going a little nuts. I mean, I was going, God, I really, really want to please you, and I'm not doing a very good job, but how do you do this? And I decided to get into the scriptures and look up what literally pleased him. I was shocked to find the few references that really use that word about pleasing God of one we've been referring to here is this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Another one, it pleased the father to reveal his son in me. I mean, I started becoming awakened to a whole different way of pleasing God and it didn't include me. I started seeing that it was Christ that pleased the father and, and when I saw it, I'm, I didn't hear somebody share this. I looked it up, read it, and saw it. And when I saw it, I went, oh, my God, oh, my God, this is wonderful. Because this isn't, you know, it just was like a huge weight fell off of me. Because I was already seeing my inadequacy. Now I'm seeing that Christ pleases the Father, and my goal is not about myself, but about giving him the Son. That's the first step in being a priest. That's the first step. Where you begin to offer the son constantly. There was the continual burnt offering. Every day, every day, every day, all day. The continual burnt offering. There was never a time when the burnt offering wasn't being offered to God. Never a time. Continual burnt offering meant, well, continually. Continual. That was Christ given to the Father. Not over sin because it wasn't a sin offering. Listen carefully. There were two different kinds of offerings. Sweet smelling offerings. They were a sweet savor. And sin offerings which were for wrongs and sins. The burnt offering went constantly not because there were sins all the time, but because the Father wanted the Son all the time, totally apart from sin. In other words, if you never sinned, if, if all of a sudden you just shaped yourself up today and you didn't sin for a week, you still hadn't given him the burnt offering, which is Christ, the one that is a sweet savor. The scriptures talk about it. What is the, what, in the New Testament, what do the only scriptures say about a sweet savor? That we give God 
Christ, who is a sweet savor. Amen? He's the sweet savor. Well, folks, as a priest, everything you do. But again, now, it's, this is not as complicated as it sounds. The Father's pleased with the Son. I have a choice at this moment. Will I give him me or will I give him the Son? He's getting the Son. I want him to have the Son. When it becomes an issue of our life, if the thing really is our life, then, there's, then there is struggle. Can I get amen? amen? When it is our life, there's struggle. Because then we're going, well, I don't know if I want to give that. Well, whatever you're given probably isn't Jesus then. You know what I mean? So, you know, whether you give it or you do without or whatever else, it's, if it's not Christ, we think it is honored of God because it's sacrificial. But the truth is, the word sacrificial comes from the word sacrifice. And again, the only acceptable sacrifice is Christ. So, so when the scriptures declare that we are living sacrifices, what do you think that means? It means if it's sacrificial, we're giving the acceptable sacrifice. It means we lay down our life that Christ may come forth. Not just that, but that the Father may receive that which is well-pleasing to him. Our goal is is pleasing the Father, not pleasing man, not pleasing ourself by being sacrificial, you know. Does that make sense? So, this, so these scriptures are, I mean, <clears throat> incredible when you begin to realize this. Unholy priesthood to offer up, here's, here's your purpose, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. In other words, you're not offering up a lamb and a goat and you know, you're not shedding the, the, the blood of goats and sprinkling it on an altar. You are one with Jesus. And I'll try to close with this. You are one with Jesus. And what does that mean in terms of this? Jesus was both priest and sacrifice. And so are you. <laughs> so are you. Yeah. And that means that our life is all wrapped up with sacrifice. But never living sacrificially apart from Christ. Always honoring the Father. Not with what we don't give or what we don't do. I mean, think about that. I'm honoring God by what I'm not doing. No, no, no. You honor God with what you do when you give him the son. Then you're a priest. Then you're in tune with the Father. Then you're bringing glory to him. And uh, let's see. I probably uh, shouldn't say anything about, yeah, shouldn't say anything about verse 9 yet. Just simply, the spiritual sacrifices are daily, moment by moment, and they are one, one act. Even though, I'm saying that because of this, Israel offered up a bullock for this and offered up uh, a, uh, a goat for this, and there were all sorts of things like that. But strangely enough, the bottom line is you don't have to memorize all the offerings to be a good priest. I mean, think about it, you know. You, you know, well, you say, well, I want to be a good priest, but that lep leper offering sort of got me thrown a little bit. Now, you take two doves, and then you, you hold one over the water, and you, you know, you rip one of them's head off, and, Okay, I can't really remember how all that goes. And right now, I'm in church, and I'm trying to rip a dove's head off. What, is, what does that mean? 
it's real, it's real simple. This is not complicated. There's only one sacrifice that honors the Father. You give him Jesus continually at the expense of you being burned up. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. Christ liveth in me. That is the testimony of a royal priest. Of a kingdom priest is really what that means. All right, let's take a little break and we'll come back and 